a polarized court, weighing a reversal of the safety net. The Supreme Court has become a more partisan institution in recent decades, more closely resembling the other branches of government than it once did. This week we'll start to show just how partisan the court has become. On Wednesday, it will hear arguments in the latest challenge to the health care law, a case that has received less attention than the 2012 challenge did but also is of great consequence. Of the 10 million people who have health insurance thanks to the law, the court could effectively take it from about 5 million of them. There are few if any historical precedents for a rollback of the social safety net as large as this one would be. Social Security, Medicare and the minimum wage were never extended to millions of people and then withdrawn. This case, King v. Burwell, has the potential by next year to reduce the number of Americans with health insurance by 8 million, the equivalent of the entire population of Virginia. If it happens, the decision is most likely to be along sharply partisan lines, with the five Republican-appointed justices voting one way and the four Democratic-appointed justices the other. There are, of course, other possible outcomes to the case. In 2012, two Democratic appointees joined with their more conservative colleagues to block much of the health law's Medicaid expansion, while Chief Justice John Roberts, a George W. Bush appointee, sided with the more liberal justices in upholding the rest of the law. But such cross-party rulings, once the norm in major cases, no longer are. Instead, the justices often vote much the way the presidents who appointed them and senators who supported them would hope. Presidents now choose justices with greater focus on their ideology. The justices' clerks emerge from competing networks, working for think tanks, law professors and lower court judges linked to one party or the other. No wonder that the current court is the first one in American history in which close, major cases regularly feature all of the Democratic appointees and all of the Republican ones on opposite sides. But none of those previous splits have had nearly the real-world impact that the King case could have. A ruling for the plaintiffs would cancel the subsidies that millions of people receive to buy health insurance, in about three dozen states. Without such subsidies, most of those people would not be able to afford insurance. The sickest would still try to buy plans, however, driving up prices for everyone else and most likely causing some people even without subsidies to be unable to afford coverage. The court's ruling is expected to be announced in June. The legal arguments revolve around a four-word phrase in one section of the law, which says that the subsidies should go to people who buy insurance on marketplaces established by the state. Only 13 states have set up these marketplaces, while 34, mostly Republican-run ones, have declined to do so. Residents of those states instead buy insurance through a federal marketplace. Three states are in a kind of middle ground. Continue reading the main story Continue reading the main story. Continue reading the main story. The strongest part of the plaintiff's argument is that for a word phrase. The rest of the law tends to distinguish carefully between the federal government and the states. By itself, the phrase seems to mean what the plaintiffs say it means, to receive subsidies you need to buy insurance on a state-established exchange. The weakest part of the plaintiff's argument is everything else about the law. In drafting it, Congress members and Obama administration officials never suggested that subsidies should apply only to state exchanges. To the contrary, much of the law, including its Madison Avenue-esque name, the Affordable Care Act, depends on the subsidies being available to everyone. The four-word phrase appears to have been an unintentional bit of murkiness, if not an outright mistake. Not until the plaintiffs came up with their novel legal argument did its alternative possible meaning receive serious attention. From the standpoint of judicial philosophy, there is nothing particularly liberal or conservative about how to resolve the question of whether one phrase trumps the rest of the law. In a 2000 ruling, for instance, three Republican-appointed members of the court, Justices Kennedy, Scalia and Thomas, all ruled against a literal reading of the word drug in a case involving the Food and Drug Administration, notes Nicholas Bagley of the University of Michigan. Yet lower court judges over the past year have tended to rule on the four-word phrase almost exactly as you would predict if you knew only the president who appointed them. If the Supreme Court does the same, a big if, it will be a remarkable moment. A Republican-appointed majority of justices would do what Republican politicians have been trying, without success to do for the last five years, repeal much of Obamacare. And the court would be doing so only three years after upholding most of the same law. When I asked historians if they could think of any similar undoing of an existing part of the social safety net, several said they could not. 
The court blocked parts of President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal, but never dismantled such a large program already underway. The best known piece of health care law to be repealed by Congress, a 1988 law expanding catastrophic coverage in Medicare, was far narrower than the Affordable Care Act. It was also only starting to go into effect when Congress undid it, in 1989. Julian Zleiser, a Princeton historian and the author of a new book on the 1960s expansion of the safety net, said the closest analogy might be Reconstruction and the reaction to it. An enormous federal effort initially succeeded in expanding civil rights in the South, only to be reversed in later years. The reversal lasted deca. Day. Reconstruction is obviously a charged, and imperfect, analogy. For one thing, the people who would lose health insurance now would be predominantly white Southerners, but the fact that no better precedent comes to mind underscores the highly unusual nature of what could happen at the Supreme Court. As careful and technical as the justices' language will surely be, no matter what their ruling is, the result won't be technical at all. A 5-4 ruling that effectively cancelled health insurance for several million people would most likely become the country's dominant political issue, in short order. An increasingly partisan, polarized country would have a Supreme Court moving in a similar direction.